Welcome to She Said Homestead, the podcast that explores homesteading from a range of perspectives. We're Sage and Michaela, two homesteaders, each with unique experiences, properties, and future goals for our homesteads. We're discussing various homesteading topics, sharing our personal experiences as women working full-time who are managing homesteads as well, and shining a light on the stories of other inspiring homesteaders. Before we dive in, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoy our podcast, please consider leaving a review. It really helps us grow and share these homesteading stories with even more people. Hey there, guys. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Michaela from Calico Cow Acres. And I'm Sage from Terra Nova Acres, and we both have homesteads in Western North Carolina. Today, we have another guest on, and she's actually a guest who's back because she was in our first couple episodes, and her name is Red. She has a homestead in upstate South Carolina. This episode is going to be focused on Red and just kind of a spotlight on her and her homestead. But before we get into our actual topic, Red, why don't you tell us about your week? Hi! It's good to be back. Um, What did I get into this week? I picked some peaches off of our tiny baby little peach tree. That was super exciting. I celebrated with my family my grandfather's 90th birthday, which is also very exciting. Very cool. And then I did like regular work stuff, which for me is painting and running an art business. So that's what I got into this week. What about you, Sage? Well, it's been incredibly hot here for one and no rain so i've been dragging my singular sprinkler (laughs) around the pasture (laughs) and the food garden and the flower gardens to keep that watered i moved the the chicks out of the brooder i put them on grass so everyone's very excited about that and i caved and bought an ac unit (laughs) so that I can actually uh, fall asleep at night and so that hopefully this summer I won't have to check my forecast to figure out uh, what night would be the least miserable to do things like canned tomatoes. <laughs> so, not anything too eventful, but uh, yeah, just trying to get through this heat wave. Do you not have central AC in your house? <laughs> no, I do not. That's it's too fancy for my blood, but I feel like I'm living in luxury now that I can actually... Um, you know, have a house that's not 80 degrees at 2 p.m. when it's 90 degrees outside. Nice. That is luxury. I was going to ask you guys about the rain because I don't think that we've gotten rain since like Memorial Day weekend when we got that huge storm. And Mm -hmm. it's really freaking dry. I've also Mm -hmm. been on sprinkler duty. Taylor just mowed the yard and it was so dusty and like half of our front yard Everything that's grass and not clover is just, like, crispy. Yeah, we got one small rain last night or the night before, but other than that, it hasn't been since Memorial Day. It's been a long time. We don't know the last rain that I got here. It's been at least a week and a half. We were supposed to get rain a couple nights ago. It was, like, 80% chance, and I was so excited, and then I woke up and checked the rain gauge, and I was like, it didn't rain. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's brutal, but hopefully we'll get some this weekend. The weather app keeps teasing me because it keeps saying thunderstorm tomorrow and then it goes away and then it says tomorrow, then it goes away every single freaking day. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to use the sprinkler today because it's supposed to rain tonight. And then I'm like, my plans are crispy. It's said consistently for a week that it's supposed to rain on Thursday and it stayed that that day so i'm really 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 hoping that it actually rains but once we get into july it should start raining like every day again which i'm cool with at this point because then my plants can actually grow i'm excited for that because dragging that hose around the garden is not it Mm -hmm. (laughs) not a fan of that (laughs) yep i i have one hose in the raised bed area which is the closest to my house and then I've been taking my gorilla cart, which currently has a flat tire. And so that tire is just like, or like the wheel itself is just shredding. But I've been taking my gorilla cart and filling it with buckets and a watering can and carting it over to the other garden to water it every other day, which is a lot. The things we do for our plants. Well, other than 
making sure your plants don't go crispy. What have you been up to this week, Michaela? I got really sunburnt this weekend going to a mead festival. <laughs> we took the weekend off of filming, which was really nice. Um, I've kind of got some vid- videos banked, so I've been able to like put out more content somehow lately. I took the weekend off for my birthday and we went to a mead festival and I got to pet kittens. And I don't know why they had kittens there. I think that it was like a donation thing, like the parking donated to a rescue or something. But I got to pet kittens. That's all that really matters. Almost took one home. If it wasn't 100 degrees outside and we had AC in the car, I probably would have taken one home. There was an orange one named Hemingway and I really wanted him. What else did I do besides turn 28 and pet a kitten? Oh, I finished planting the like veggie garden, the first round of veggie garden stuff an hour before this episode, like, before we started recording. So that feels really good. I had to set up a new garden trellis area to do that. That was really hot, and I'm glad it's done. I still have flowers to plant and succession sowing and things. I think the most exciting thing, besides the kittens, that I did this week was I ordered fall garden seeds, which is really weird to think about. I got birthday cards in the mail with money in them, and I was like, seeds. <laughs> Enough about us. Red, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? I am a full time painter and tattooer, and I would say part time homesteader. I'm originally from Columbia, Chapin ish, South Carolina, and I've lived kind of all over. And now we live in the upstate. I live on a five acre homestead with my husband, Stephen, and our four cats, our dog, and our other farm critters. That's me. And that's what I do. Before we get into the the hard hitting questions, we're going to go through some rapid fire questions that are just fun little ones just to get to know you a little bit. So the first one is, what's your favorite color? Ooh, uh, I would say green. We are good with that answer. We we're both fans of green. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know it's like kind of a rule that I should be the that should be my favorite color given that I paint plants and I'm a homesteader, but it's just such a good color. It's so good. <laughs> How about your favorite tomato variety? Oh ma'am. <laughs> Rude. Favorite tomato variety. Okay. I think I'm going to say, honestly, any variety that gets really big and juicy enough for a tomato sandwich, whether that's, um, I know Cherokee Purple is really popular around here, beefsteak style, whatever, any of those varieties, those are my faves. I know that you have some really cool jobs right now. What is the most interesting or unique or weird job you've ever had? Ooh, that's a really good question. I think it's a tie between tattooing and being a barista because with both of those jobs, the people you meet, like you meet so many different, like interesting, cool, strange sometimes people like you, you meet everybody. And so, yeah, that's. That's what's made those jobs very interesting, I think. What is your most procrastinated homestead chore? (laughs) Ooh, that's a good question, too. Most procrastinated homestead chore, building things. I'm going to say building things. We wait till the last minute to build whatever it is that we need to build. And that's just how it is. (laughs) We just just wait. (laughs) What are you most excited to harvest from your garden this year? I'm the most excited about harvesting black beans. I'm not sure if they're going to work. I'm not sure if they're going to get eaten by the deer. But if they survive, I'm excited to try those. Are you more of a movie person or more of a TV show person? In the past, I would have said more of a movie person. But these days, I'm more of a show person because the shows last longer and I can get more invested in the characters over a longer period of time. This isn't part of the question, but what's your favorite show? (laughs) My favorite show, I'm going to have to say Gilmore Girls, because I've watched that show so many times. So many times. That's the only right answer, in my opinion. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, Michaela, you know about the show. Okay, my actual question was, what art technique or style do you enjoy like creating the most? I enjoy abstract, illustrative florals using acrylic paint. That's my favorite. That's so specific. I love it. <laughs> it is. Yes. What's your go-to music genre? It's hard to pinpoint. Um, I think the easiest term would be bossa nova, but more specifically, like 60s cocktail lounge music is that's my go to. I was Henry not expecting Manson. that answer, but that's a good answer. Oh, what were you <laughs> really? Expecting? What were you expecting? I don't know. Not that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one trips most people up, to be honest. I, I've answered that question, like, you know, individually in like random conversations. And most people are like, really? All right. The first of the real questions is where are you located? I'm located in upstate South Carolina. We're about pretty much smack dab in the middle, right between Greenville, South Carolina and Asheville, North Carolina. What went into the decision of getting a property there? Uh, a large part of it was family. So we live about 10 minutes away from my brother. We visited my brother in, I think, 2021. And we just completely fell in love with the area. Since I'm from the, like the middle of the state, I grew up coming out here for visits and whatnot. But for some reason, I never came to this specific area. Like I would go to Asheville for a day trip or a weekend or something. Um, I'd go to Greenville for a day trip and things like that. But I never really ventured in between those two places. And when we visited my brother, we both fell in love with the area. And it was nice because they also live here and um, we really like hanging out with them. So it was nice getting to live close enough to them that we can just easily hang out for pretty much my whole life, adult life. I've lived way too far away from my brother to be able to hang out. So it's nice that we can hang out with them now. That was a large part of it. And what animals do you raise on your homestead? We have ducks, geese, guinea fowl, and we have one rooster who is a chicken. Who you inherited from Michaela, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> papaya. His name is Papaya, and he's wonderful. I never had intentions of having chickens, and he's the first chicken that I've ever really even interacted with, like handled and things like that. Um, and we love him. He's great. He's a lot of fun. He's such a sweet, handsome boy. Yes. Although we have noticed he will get sassy with us when we handle the ducks and the geese so otherwise he's like pretty much always chill but if you pick up one of the geese or you pick up one of the ducks he'll come at you he will protect his friends which is actually really cute that's his flock mm -hmm. <laughs> do you consider yourself a homesteader why or why not i do consider myself a homesteader i think i meet at least all of the minimum qualifications of such. So I think it's safe to say that I'm a homesteader. What are those qualifications in your brain? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, what I think of when I think of homesteading is trying your best to at least somewhat live off the land, you know, gardening, things like that. If you have animals, like farm type of animals, using those to create some sort of an ecosystem, whether that's, you know, you're a large scale farmer or you're using them for eggs or to help in the garden, things like that. But I also think it can be little things such as that would be more suitable for urban homesteading, which would be, you know, making sourdough bread or canning if you can can or creating products for yourself that are more sustainable and help you I guess, be less dependable or less dependent on the sort of systems at large, getting back to living closer to the earth, hippie stuff. I don't know. <laughs> hippie stuff. So then how long have you been, you know, gardening? And then how long have you been homesteading? I think it's safe to say that I've been gardening for four years and homesteading for 
three-ish years, two, three-ish years. I had a garden when I was a kid with my family, but I don't remember a whole lot of that process. Like I remember that we had it. I remember some of the things that we did, but it was also a very conventional garden where we used all of the sort of standard pesticides and herbicides with that space. And then I had other plants, food types of plants throughout my 20s, but I would say I did proper gardening starting four years ago. And then I started doing more homestead-like activities three years ago. And then we moved on to our current property which is, I would call it more of a large scale homestead two years ago. So when did you guys move there? I know it was like around the same time we got our house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we moved to this property in June of 2022. So right at two years ago. So however, it's kind of interesting to think about because we've had three growing seasons. So we had the 2022 growing season, 2023 growing season, and now we're in our third growing season in 2024. So we've been here for two years, but we've had three growing seasons. And Sage, you moved to your property in like February of 22? If I can do math correctly, which I think I can, yes. Okay, so we we're all like, we all moved to our homesteads within like that same year, which is interesting. It's like, kind of within Mm -hmm. six months or so of each other you guys have an extra growing season on me I just like to to place things in my brain so I'm just asking for that reason when did y'all move to your place I can't remember like what month of the year October of 2022 okay okay gotcha could you describe your homestead setup for us so we have five acres about one acre is woods and forest and just sort of wildlife area that acre is at the very back of the property and then we have about an acre of an orchard most of which were trees that were were already here there we have several really old trees that aren't really producing so much and then we have a handful of trees that were already here and they are struggling with some disease issues so We do have an orchard, but it's not really producing the way that you would think an orchard would. Um, But nonetheless, we have about an acre of orchard. And then the rest is pretty much either our house and like, you know, outbuildings and things like that. The rest is all field. So it's fescue. We've got Johnson grass and poison ivy and Bradford pears and all kinds of little saplings. Uh, But it's basically just like a wild field area. So that's more or less the setup that we have. So tell us a little bit about your backstory and how and why you decided to get into homesteading. As I said earlier, I have a like a little bit of a background in terms of when I was a kid, we had a garden for several years. Uh, also, when I was a kid, I, I grew up basically trying to convince my parents to let me have any and any animal that they would let me have, whether that was like, you know, a rescued wild bird, you know, that fell out of you know, its nest, or we raised a baby squirrel one time because it fell out of its nest, you know, any dog that I could get my parents to to let me have, I was obsessed with animals. Along with that came, um, I had quite a few opportunities when I was growing up to train horses. And at some of these barns that I worked at, they would sometimes have other animals. And so I'd get to experience those other animals. Uh, We raised a sheep when I was younger. We raised ducks. So even though I didn't grow up on like a proper homestead, I have little bits and pieces of that background. And I loved it. I loved every second of it. So fast forward to when I graduated high school and had to, you know, going to college and thinking about my life as an adult, I didn't think that I could have any of that as an adult. I couldn't sort of see a way to make 
to make money at it. And that was sort of my, my number one uh, focus at that time was, okay, I'm going to college, got to figure out how to make money, how to make a living, how to be an adult. So I basically put that chapter to bed. I said goodbye to all of that. And I focused on university and I focused on career and all of that sort of thing. Fast forward to living in Richmond and being a tattooer and 2020 hit. And at that time, for whatever reason, I think this happened with a lot of people, the Instagram and YouTube algorithm started feeding me all of these homesteaders. I had no idea that that was even a thing, that hobby farming was a thing. I didn't know that that existed. In my mind, it was either you were really wealthy and you had a horse farm, or you were like a proper farmer who, when I say proper farmer, I mean like industrial level farmer. I didn't know that homesteading existed. I started seeing a, a handful of accounts. Um, I'll name them here in case anybody wants to look them up. Angela at Axon Root Homestead was a really big one. And then Mandy at Wild Oaks Farms. Those two accounts were like, oh, wait a second. These people are adults and they have regular jobs and they also have a farm. And it was really interesting too, because Angela has horses and she has sheep and she has ducks. All three of these things are, these are all critters that I had experience with growing up. And so I was like, wait a second, I'm an adult. I can have that, surely. And so that was really what started it. And I started doing some research and I started digging into it. And I just like wanted to see if I could figure out how to have that myself. And also at that same time, I had just met my partner, who's now my husband, and we were sort of, you know, it was like early relationship days and we were trying to figure out like, is this going to be serious? Uh, is it not going to be serious? What's the deal? And I sort of presented this to him. I was like, eh, homesteading? Do you like this idea? And he was like, yeah, that sounds sick. Let's do it. And so fast forward, we did get serious. We decided to stay together. We decided to buy a house together. And at the same time, we decided to move six hours away to upstate South Carolina. And we just kind of jumped all in. So here we are. I was going to ask you if Stephen was on board, um, but you kind of answered that. So is mm -hmm. there anything in particular about like homesteading that he is like the most excited about like that's his thing on your homestead his main focus is the building projects he loves to build things whether it's building cars which is what he does for a living or building structures or any number of projects he loves to build things uh he's interested in the garden but he he hasn't done he doesn't hasn't done like a deep dive into the research um he doesn't have as much hands on experience with that as i do um that's kind of been my realm and then he also is passionate about the critters he loves animals and he didn't have experience with birds like i did before but he's 100% embraced it he absolutely loves all of them so he's he's been a really, really big help, especially when it comes to like troubleshooting. If we have any issues, um, he'll do research. I'll do research. We'll both kind of tackle it together if we can. He works a more traditional full-time job, like a nine to five kind of thing. So there are, since I work from home, there are a lot of times when that stuff will fall to me just because of timing. I would also say He's passionate also about just sort of creating a, an ecosystem here in general. He's passionate about sort of the the long term and the big picture kind of stuff. So it was definitely, it was my thing in the beginning. I definitely was the instigator for all of it, uh, for this lifestyle, but he, he does, he does enjoy it. And he's sort of dove in headfirst with me, which is really fun and really nice because 
I think it, it would be perfectly fine if, if this was my own thing and it was not his thing, but it's really nice that we can talk about it and nerd out together. And it would be a different type of challenge if, if he was not interested in it. So it's really cool that he is. I think we have the same life. <laughs> yeah. We have the same husband. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> there are a lot of similarities. It's it's true. <laughs> They're like very, very similar humans in general. Do you guys see yourself homesteading long term? And if so, what scale do you see that happening at? Ooh, yes. I can definitely see myself and I can see us homesteading long term. Scale, to be perfectly honest with you is going to depend on finances. I would be perfectly happy expanding or getting a bigger property and really doing it up and going larger scale. Um, having the experience with horses that I do, I'm mixed on whether or not I would want to have a property large enough for horses because that's like a whole other beast. But if I had the finances, then yeah, sure. However, I don't foresee that becoming my reality. I and I think with where we're at financially and like with our work lives and things like that, I'm perfectly happy with with the homestead that we have. I think we have plenty of plenty to do and plenty of room to to sort of expand to our limits. And then I think from there like long term long term I think I definitely would want to probably scale back as I got older, just because this lifestyle is really, it's a lot of work, like hard, heavy, manual labor. So that I think would be the other limitation is my body, like our bodies physically, what we are able to do. But I can definitely see myself doing this long term. So do you think you'd get, like, if you're expanding... Like, do you mm -hmm. mean like your flock of birds or like, would you venture into other animals besides horses or like, what would that look like? I would love to expand our flock. I think that that is something that we could reasonably do within the next uh, two or three years. I'd love to have bees. That's definitely on the list of critters I'd like to bring in. And I'd really like to have... Ideally, for, for the space that we have, I would love to bring in sheep and donkeys. However, I think at some point we will need to bring in goats because of the vegetation that we have. We have a lot of kudzu and we have things in our field that I think goats will like to eat. So even though goats are not number one on my priority list as far as animals that I would enjoy or would like to have, sheep and donkeys are, my, are first on that list. But I think we'll need to we'll need to get goats at some point to help <laughs> to help with our situation. I'll bring my goats over sometime. Just leave them there for oh. a little while. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> There's also a chance. I was actually talking. So my my brother and his family they also homestead. They're the ones that live ten minutes away from us, which is really cool. It's nice to to have not just family who are also friends, but are also homesteading friends. So they have a couple of pigs that they just sort of acquired through a situation. And I was considering the other day, maybe borrowing their pigs for a year or two so that they can help us. I don't know if it's possible, but if it is possible, if they could root up all of our Johnson grass and get rid of our Johnson grass and our devil's tomatoes, that would be awesome. I'm not sure if that would work, but it's a possibility. So I don't want pigs long term. They'll, they'll root up kudzu. People tell us all the time to get pigs for the kudzu because it's got the tubers oh, yeah. that are like massive in the ground. If you leave them in a yeah. spot long enough, they'll root up the kudzu. So again, same with us. Like we don't really hey. know what we do with them. Like, we'd rather have goats just because we like goats, but mm -hmm. pigs are a good option for that, too. Yeah, the Johnson grass is my biggest concern. I would say the Johnson grass, and then next to that would be the devil's tomatoes, because both of those things, the Johnson grass is fine as long as it doesn't freeze, 
if we have a hard freeze, then when it wilts because of the freeze, it produces hydrogen cyanide, which is obviously a toxin. And if your ruminants eat it, then it can, I mean, it can kill them from what I understand. And that's like everywhere. And then we also have devil's tomatoes, which I'm not sure, I'm not sure how toxic that one is, but I think it's pretty potent. So if I could just get those guys to root those two things up and the Johnson grass is a rhizome grass and I'm based on the research that I've done, those rhizomes go pretty deep. So they would have to really do a good job. I don't know. It might be, it's either that or having my, like hiring one of my neighbors to till several times. And even then I'm not sure how much better or worse that would be like how much, um, how much more thorough of a job that that would be versus the pigs. We're going to have to figure something out because the Johnson grass can't stay. (laughs) It's going to be the bane of my existence right next to Bermuda grass. Yay. When it comes to gardening and your gardening philosophy, uh, I'm curious about that. Are there certain things that you make sure to do? Are there certain things that you definitely avoid? I definitely avoid pesticides like the plague. To be more specific, the chemical stuff. I avoid Roundup like the plague. I've actually never in my life used Roundup that I am aware of. Like maybe we used it when I was a kid, but I don't remember using that specifically. But in my adult life, I've never used it. And I'm feeling pretty uh, determined to never use it. So No pesticides, no herbicides. I'm trying this year actually to avoid cardboard because I've tried it in the past and it has not worked the way that I felt like it should. And it was a lot of work. And I work with cardboard all the time in my job. That stuff has got some pretty serious adhesives and it kind of freaks me out. So I'm trying to avoid that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be... 100% successful in that. I may end up using it in the pathways. We'll see. But I'm also really lazy. So that's another thing that I try to avoid is working harder than I have to work. So some things that I will go out of my way to do are things like I will go out of my way to make compost. I throw away every, or not, I don't throw away. I put every single kitchen scrap I can into the compost, mostly just because I think it's it's fun and cool to take your literal kitchen garbage and turn it into soil. It's so sick. It, it's like magic every time. It actually reminds me of like the dark room in like photography class when you have this nothing piece of paper and you expose it to light and then you put it in this water bath and it just turns into a photograph suddenly. It's 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 like magic. Uh, I feel the same way about compost. So I have a lot of fun making compost. Uh, I also use worms for vermicompost, and that's that's been a lot of fun. I do go out of my way to pay particular attention to my soil. I also go out of my way to work less. And so sometimes, to be perfectly honest with you, I will just throw seeds on the ground and then throw a bunch of mulch on top of it. And the idea behind it is that the mulch will help keep everything sort of moist and that will germinate everything. And then from there, they can, the mulch will feed the soil that's underneath it, the red clay, really, let's be honest. And as it softens the red clay with the moisture and everything that it's feeding, you know, into the soil, then that'll make it easier for the little seedlings to grow roots. I think that about covers it. I'm a bit of a chaos gardener. I'm not going to lie. I try lots of different things and just see what works. And sometimes it's like, well, well, I don't know. Maybe this will take. Maybe it won't. Maybe you'll die. But we'll just see how it goes. And then we go from there. What is your general (laughs) philosophy when it comes to raising animals? Hmm. As far as the raising of the animals, my general philosophy is I do my very best to give them a good life, a happy life. I can't currently give them the life that I would like to. I would like to be able to let them be more free range than they're currently able to. But we live very close to a pretty main road. And we've had 
a few losses and then we've had them go. I've just corralled them one too many times, keeping them away from the road. So because of that and our lack of infrastructure, they can't be as free range as I would like them to be. However, we did invest in some uh, of like the electric netting and I feel like they have a pretty good life. I really do. So as long as I can keep them healthy and happy as much as I am able to do that, that's, that's my general philosophy. As far as the raising of the animals, as far as what animals I bring onto the homestead, that's a little bit more fluid. I try to think about what they're going to contribute to the homestead. Like, are they going to have a positive impact or a negative impact? Because in general, my philosophy with the homestead is I'm trying to create a, a positive ecosystem here, something that's going to be thriving and work together and not work, not work against itself. And so I don't want to bring an animal onto the homestead that's going to have some a negative impact. However, I do think that most animals that you would bring onto a homestead, you can work something out, you can figure something out so that they won't have a negative impact. So that's why that's a little bit more fluid. They may not always have a specific purpose or the specific purpose might be, we just like them and I'm okay with that. I know a lot of homesteaders feel very sort of Mm, intense is not the word. They feel very strongly about only bringing in an animal if it has a specific purpose for the homestead. I don't feel that way as much, but that's because we all heard the story about how when I was a child, I would try to convince my parents to let me get whatever animal I could think of. So, you know, consider your source here, right? Of all of the things that you grow, whether that's in the garden or outside of the garden, what is your favorite to grow? Can I do one of each? One in the garden and one outside of the garden? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In the garden, yikes, it changes year to year. I would say this year, my favorite thing, my peach tree. That has been the most fun to watch. And I tried to start a little guild for it too. It's not a very large guild, but it's a start. And I'm excited to see that continue. Last year, my favorite thing to grow was definitely loofah, hands down. That plant is wild if you ever get a chance to grow it. It's so much fun. It's massive. So be prepared. And then outside of the garden, my favorite thing is, I'm going to say guineas. The guineas are my favorite. As much as attached as I am to our geese, I love, I deeply love our geese. But the guineas, are so much fun and they're the easiest birds. They are so easy. What is your favorite part about this lifestyle? My favorite thing is watching things grow. I just love it. It's so exciting when when like a seedling pops up and then it gets big and then maybe it produces a flower or fruit or something and you see all the pollinators. I just love watching things grow. Same with the ducks and the geese and the guineas. Watching things grow is my favorite, hands down. What has been your biggest challenge so far? Either, you know, starting the homestead, because that is, that is a beast of a task, or, you know, balancing working a full-time job with part-time homesteading. I think the hardest thing has been starting the homestead. I I actually think that... My job with the way that it is currently has really helped with that transition. Um, it's helped with the homesteading aspect because I mostly work from home. I do go in to Asheville occasionally to tattoo, but the amount of time that I spend working that type of a job where I'm leaving the house and going to work is a lot less now than it used to be. And so just... Just working from home alone has like that in and of itself has really helped, I think, with the the transition of of homesteading and raising animals and checking on the garden and things like that. I yeah, I'm with you. Starting the homestead, just all of it, the infrastructure, the gardening, you know, starting new garden spaces. We've had to we've had this is our fourth actually, fourth garden space since we've been here. 
And then all of the things that come along with, with raising animals too, it's a lot. It is a whole lot, especially when you're doing it all at the same time. It would be different maybe if you start by focusing on infrastructure or then you move to gardening and then you get your animals. But we all three have done about the same thing where we jumped in head first and we did all of it all at the same time. So it's been a lot. And then that plus, and I think all of us probably have the same experience too, our house has had some pretty wild, pretty big issues. And that, <laughs> that's that been a lot too on top of the homestead. So it's a lot, y'all. It's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I just don't fix anything in my house. I just let it be what it is. And then if I don't fix it, I you know, you kind of don't have to worry about it, right? That's how that works? Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So with, you know, all of these challenges that you encounter building a homestead, with all of the manual labor that goes into it, have you ever thought about quitting? No. Have definitely had some moments where I've thought, oh boy, did I take on more than I could handle? Was this a, not the right choice? But quitting? No, I've never thought about quitting. Because even in the worst moments where you're questioning your sanity, it's still magical. So I've never thought about quitting. Yes. I feel like... The criteria you talked about at the beginning of this, like where you said you do consider yourself a homesteader, having that moment mm -hmm. where you're like, oh boy, <laughs> I think that's part of the criteria. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> so how do you balance the garden and homestead obligations with all of the other obligations you've got in life between work and husband and all of the other stuff? <laughs> oh, honestly... Sometimes it doesn't get balanced. Sometimes if everybody's fed and safe, that's it. That's all we're doing. As long as the garden is kind of alive, then that's all we're doing. You know, one priority when we moved here was that I wouldn't be a slave, that neither one of us would be a, a slave to, to the homestead. Partially because you know, one of the reasons that we moved here was so that we could be closer to family and spend time with them. I mean, like, like I just said, my grandfather just turned 90. We're really close to that side of the family. And we're really close to Steven's side as well. They live farther away. But if they're coming into town, if they call me randomly and say, hey, we're coming into town, they're going to take priority over any homestead stuff. And these days, because I spent so many years not prioritizing my mental health, mental health is like a huge priority now. And sometimes that does not mean piddling in the garden or doing a project. Sometimes that means I'm saying goodbye to the homestead and I'm going on a hike or something like that. So to be honest, I don't really know that there is a balance. <laughs> I am doing the best I can with any number of things at any given time. Whether that's I'm prioritizing my business and the laundry and the homestead projects are going to fall by the wayside, or whether that means I am focusing on a homestead project and maybe I'm a little bit late on my sales tax for the month, you know, <laughs> I'm just kind of taking it one day at a time. I feel like that fits well with how you kind of describe it as the hobby farm occasionally, because it is like... Mm -hmm. something that you do because it brings you joy and it's not necessarily something mm -hmm. that you're like oh I'm trying to grow all my food or do all this you're just like you're embracing it as it comes and that makes so like it makes sense to me that you're like okay I can pause this if I need to yeah I don't have that totally I don't have that setting <laughs> so I, I also don't understand but I get it at the same <laughs> yeah yeah, I wouldn't say this works for everybody. I mean, because along with this way of doing things for me, and for, for us, for me and, and Stephen both, it comes with sometimes projects are left half done for a while. It comes with sometimes currently, currently we have two 
baskets of laundry sitting in the living room. They've been there for several days. And I'm not positive that I'm going to get to it even this week. So, uh, you know, it just, it is what it is, I guess. But like you said, like with it being a hobby farm, I feel like because I've made it a hobby, I'm not trying to like making any sort of income off of it is not my priority because I'm lucky enough to have income coming in elsewhere. Because of that, I it's a luxury that I get to like put it on pause. So like I look at you guys and A, I'm super impressed for one, because like I see all of the work that y'all are doing. You're podcasting and you're YouTubing and you're keeping up with your social medias. Like I can't imagine doing that. I mean, yes, I am doing that. Some of that with my like day job, but that's my day job. Like that's what I spend all of my day doing. You guys do an entire day job and then you do all of these other things with your homestead. And on top of that, you're actually doing homesteading. Like I, I'm not strong enough to do that. I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. All of that to say it's really, I think it's really, really cool when people are doing all of those things. And I wish I had half of that energy and <laughs> I know myself well enough to know that I, to know that I don't have that much energy. It's much about energy as it is compulsion. <laughs> At least for me. Something that we haven't touched on yet is that you are plant-based. So what differences or unique challenges have you encountered homesteading from that plant-based perspective? Ooh, that's a very good question. Some differences. The main difference that I have noticed is, uh, I guess, the way we handle sickness, injury, and death might look a little bit different. When I talk to other homesteaders, if we're having, for instance, if we're having an injury issue or a sickness in issue with one of our birds... A lot of other homesteaders will make the comment to me, oh, well, that bird just would have been duck soup or, you know, chicken dinner or whatever, which that makes sense. That's logical. And that is definitely like in line with the way a lot of homesteads work. For us, that's not something that even if, honestly, even if we did eat meat, that's not something that would turn me into a vegetarian because I don't think I could have the stomach to do it. So that difference in and of itself is, is a pretty big one. We just handle those situations differently than other people and we pay for it. Like we've had quite a few really hefty vet bills because of that. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time researching and trying different things that we've researched to try and fix issues that we've had. So that's one of the main differences. Another difference is probably, actually, this might not be that much of a difference, but we also don't really eat our eggs. Like every now and then I'll eat an egg. Every now and then I'll feed an egg to Mochi, our dog. But since we don't eat eggs, but we have ducks, we have girl ducks. They produce eggs. We are drowning in eggs. We only have five ducks that can lay eggs and we are drowning in eggs. So I say that that's a difference, but I also know lots of other homesteaders who are drowning in eggs just because they have lots of chickens. So maybe that's not so much of a difference, but it feels like a difference. I think that about covers it. I was expecting to get a good bit of pushback from the homesteading community uh, because I've seen a lot of those types of comments on the internet with other, like directed at other plant-based homesteaders that I know. Maybe I don't get those comments or I don't get the, that pushback because I'm not as active on social media with the homestead. But in my general community here, like in the little town that we live in, we haven't gotten any pushback from it. We haven't had any weird comments. People have been very supportive and very cool of the whole idea. Usually people are curious, which has also been very cool. Yeah. The main difference is definitely that duck soup is not an option. So with 
all of those eggs that you get from the ducks that you have, do you end up giving them away or do you sell them or where do they end up? We mostly give them away to friends and family. Steven will give quite a few of them away to people that he knows at his job. Occasionally, I will cook up quite a few of them and freeze them for to give to Mochi at a later time with her with her dog food. I try not to give her too many because f- TMI maybe, but she gets the worst farts when she eats eggs. They are so disgusting. So for my own sake, I try not to feed her eggs too often, but she loves them and we have them. So occasionally she'll get an egg as a treat. I have not sold any yet, which is my own fault. I just need to actually make a sign and put it out in the yard so that people know that we have eggs. So at some point I will probably do that. That's just my own laziness. But for the most part, we we just give them away. If you could give one piece of advice for someone who wants to do what you're doing, what would it be? I would say (sighs) take your time and watch your land. That was a piece of advice that somebody gave me before I started. And I have tried my best to do that. And it has come in handy so many times. And there have also been times when I did not take time and watch my land and think about things, um, give myself time to really sort of let it play out before I made a a decision with my land. And as we all know, I have moved my garden four times. So, you know, maybe I should have waited and watched my land a little bit more before I did all of that work. (laughs) So that would be my advice is take your time. Don't rush it. I think it's really easy to want to rush it because we're all excited to do all of the things and we want that sort of end goal of full thriving homestead. We want to plant our trees now. We want to set up our garden spaces now. And I think sometimes that absolutely makes sense. Sometimes you know what's going on with a tree in a certain location, or you know what's going on with your garden. Like Michaela, you guys, you knew exactly where your garden could and should go. And it's been awesome to watch that, to watch that uh, grow. For me, however, I did not choose the location very well. And uh, then I did not choose the location very well again. So... Yeah, if you if you can wait and watch, your land will tell you things. It will let you know where things should go and where things shouldn't go. So if we want to support you, if we want to find you, what are the ways that we can do that? If you want to find our homestead, then you can look up Satan. Uh, we actually call it Satan Farmstead because Stephen liked that the way that that sounded better. Um, so Satan Farmstead on TikTok or you, or not YouTube, excuse me, TikTok or Instagram. It's mostly pictures and videos of the ducks, geese, and guineas. That's the majority of my social media fo- or social media pre- presence, uh, with the farm is cute animals, cute critters. So Satan Farmstead on TikTok or Instagram. And if you have any interest in paintings of plants, then you can find me on TikTok, Instagram, or YouTube. And that's all across the board is Red Demand. What about if somebody wants a tattoo? That you can find via my website, or you can find examples of tattoos that I've done on my Instagram Um, there's like a whole page on my website, which is just reddemon.com. And we'll put all of that down below for you guys if you want to check out any of those. All right. Well, that's all we have for you tonight. Thank you so much for coming back and joining us. We're, We're happy that you were able to come back and like we were able to do a spotlight episode with you, even though we weren't able to continue recording with you all the time. Um, we'll definitely have you back again. And yeah, this was fun. Thank y'all for having me on here again. It was so much fun. Thanks for joining us on this episode of She Said Homestead. We hope you enjoyed our chat. Before we say goodbye, we'd love to hear from you. Send your homesteading stories to us at shesaidhomestead at gmail.com. We can't wait to share them on the air. 
To stay connected, follow us on Instagram for updates and sneak peeks at what's coming up next. If you like video podcasts, make sure you subscribe to the She Said Homestead YouTube channel too. We can't thank you enough for being part of the She Said Homestead community. Until next time, happy homesteading.